Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Mintz. I'm the events director at Community Bookstore here in Brooklyn, New York. Community is Brooklyn's oldest independent bookstore, celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Um, so thank you all for spending part of your day with us, wherever you are. One of the unexpected joys of this turn to virtual events has been the opportunity to meet and connect with folks beyond our corner of the world and to work together with other booksellers, scholars, and readers. And today we're very thrilled to be collaborating with Cheris Books and More in Decatur, Georgia, the Agnes Scott College Classics Department, and the Emory University Classics Department to welcome A.E. Stallings in celebration of her new poetry collection, This Afterlife, in conversation with artist Ashley Norwood Cooper. Now to some housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings, so if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which will, is also on the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's a chat box to which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for today is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we will resolve them as quickly as we can. Um, we're very excited for another year of stellar in-person and virtual events at Community Bookstore. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One in particular that I'd like to point out is on Monday, February 6th, we're welcoming Mar Mariana Enriquez and translator Megan McDowell for their new novel, Our Share of Night, which is brought to you in collaboration with our friends at the Transnational Literature Series of Brooklyn Booksmith and Third Place Books in Seattle. Um, that program's up on our website now and taking registrations. But now, without any further ado, a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. A.E. Stallings is the author of several books of poetry, like a Pulitzer Prize finalist, Olives, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Hay Pax, winner of the Poets Prize and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Benjamin H. Banks Award, and Archaic Smile, winner of the Richard Wilbur Award. She's also published verse translations of Lucretius's The Nature of Things and Hesiod's Works and Days, as well as the Homeric epic The Battle Between the Frogs and the Mice. Stallings is a 2011 Guggenheim Fellow, a 2011 United States Artists Fellow, and a 2011 MacArthur Fellow. She lives in Athens, Greece, and is joining us from there tonight. Well, tonight there, this afternoon, here. Uh, Ashley Norwood Cooper's intensely colored, painterly, figurative work explores the creative lives of women, the awkwardness of family relationships, and the unpredictability of the natural world. She is exhibited in solo and group shows in the US and Europe, including First Street Gallery in New York City, Zinc Contemporary in Seattle, and Gallery Thomas Fuchs in Stuttgart, Germany. Her work has been featured in New American Paintings and, the, uh, and on the I Like Your Work podcast. Her debut at Volta NYC in 2020 garnered write-ups in the New York Times and the Arcade Projects zine of Columbia University. Ms. Cooper's paintings are included in public and private collections in the United States and Europe, including the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts in San Francisco and Greenville County Museum of Art in South Carolina. So without any further ado, I will hand the screen off to you. Alicia, Ashley, thank you both so, so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you um, it's wonderful to be here and to be chatting with Ashley. Actually, sometimes Ashley and I are chatting at this hour on a Saturday, but usually by the phone. Um, so it's lovely to be able to see her. Um, thank you, Noah and Community Bookstore, um, Karis Books, Agnes Scott College Classics Department, um, Emory University Classics um, for hosting this multimedia, bi-coastal, multi-continent um, event. Um, <laughs> Ashley and I have known each other, I want to say since 1988 or 89. Does that sound right? That's about exactly right, yes. Okay. So that was my freshman year at Georgia. <laughs> yeah, I was, a, I was a little bit um, further along. Um, yeah, so we've known each other since the late 1900s, as my children would say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's horrifying. Don't children. say that again. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we met in the classics department, I think, and we had both come there in kind of separate ways. But um, Ashley was studying painting. I was studying music and English literature, but we sort of gravitated to this nexus of slightly eclectic and eccentric and very interesting people. Um, and uh, one of the results of this, um, this is my latest, it's my selected poems, um, This Afterlife. Um, but as we were getting ready to publish this, um, there was a lot of talk about what to do about the cover 
um, and uh, a lot of uncertainty. And around that time, I think, Ashley, you sent me a Dropbox file of a lot of your recent work, and it was so colorful. And I felt that it captured something I think that we share, which is a certain kind of figurative and you know, technical interest, but also with some playful anarchy and a lot of um, maybe sinister anxiety at the margins. <laughs> and um, I just, I, and I was really thrilled um, that we got to use this, this painting for the cover. And this painting is called The Picnic, is that right? This is called Picnic at Sunset, yes. Picnic at Sunset. Um, and actually looking at, now, at it now on the screen, as well as on the book cover, um, you know, I love the kind of sinister ghost rabbit and mm -hmm. um, the butterflies. And it it kind of reminds me of a of a kind of Persephone and Hades thing. There's this um, hand reaching up almost out of the earth um, towards, you know, this young child. And, you know, the husband um, is sort of down lower in the painting. But um, even though it's not meant to be a, a mythological subject, it it feels to me like it has some of the same vibe as some of the underworld poems. It's certainly about a mother very concerned about her child falling off the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there was a time when we identified with Persephone, but I think that I don't, I'm more identified with the mother now. <laughs> yeah, the, even Boland has a wonderful poem about that. Um, is it called Pomegranate, I think, where she says, you know, I can, now I can enter this story at any, at any part of it. So yeah, I think now we're more on the Demeter side of things, but um, yes, we've, we've been all of the things, I think. Um and what was great about this is at the same time that FSG was um, going to re publishing um, this afterlife, they were reissuing my first book, Archaic Smile. I think um, you may also have a, a copy with the cover. And we wanted to have an update of the cover. And you know the the original cover of Archaic Smile has this photograph. Um, maybe John took this photograph of this um, oh, yeah. Kore, this ancient um, Greek sort of Persephone statue. She doesn't really quite even have the archaic smile. It's one of the curiosities of the book, but it's very handsome. And I wanted something that was kind of in conversation with that. And it was so wonderful because I needed it like right away. And Ashley, you just like whipped up several um, very much um, more up-to-date Kore images. And I love that this has got like the the headgear, but it happens to be headphones. And, um, you know, when you see color on the statues, it's got that red wavy hair and the pomegranate there. And she really does have the smile as well as the cool glasses. Yes, and I think she's a little bit inspired by our redheaded roommate, Ellen Mulligan from back in our Athens days too. So it has like this yes, long Ellen Mulligan is is in the background of that as well. <laughs> yes, as many. But here's my copy of the book, which I she said, "Can you get it out?" I was like, "It has paint all over it." So that <laughs> also tells you what an inspiration Alicia's <laughs> poems have been to me. They're always in the studio with me. Um, so I was going to read some poems, and we're going to also look at some uh, pictures, and we're going to chat, and you know, you know, you'll have to probably eventually rein us in. Um, one of the very early poems, and um, you know, I wrote this probably not too long after meeting you. Um, this is Persephone writes a letter to her mother. Um, and uh, one of the cool things about this, I found this, Ashley, I don't remember if you remember this, making this book. I it's remember like making it. I don't have a copy of it. I, this is probably the rarest of all the publications. It's this really <laughs> cool um, chat book that's just of this poem and it really looks like it's been dug up out of the ground and has been written in blood it's so cool um but anyway that's mine um so I, I made in printmaking class yeah <laughs> oh I just found it and now I just lost it no there it is Persephone writes a letter to her mother first hell is not so far underground my hair gets tangled in the roots of trees and I can just make out the crunch of footsteps 
the pop of acorns falling or the chime of a shovel squaring a fresh grave or turning up the tulip bulbs for separation. Day and night, creatures with no legs or too many journey to hell and back. Alas, the burrowing animals have dim eyesight. They are useless for news of the upper world. They say the light is loud. Their figures of speech all come from sound. Their hearing is acute. The dead are just as dull as you would imagine. They evolve like the burrowing animals, losing their sight. They may roam abroad sometimes, but just at night, they can only tell me if there was a moon. Again and again, moth-like, they are duped by any beckoning flame, lamps and candles. They come back startled and singed, sucking their fingers, happy the dirt is cool and dense and blind. They are silly and grateful and don't remember anything. I have tried to tell them stories, but they cannot attend. They pester you like children for the wrong details. How long were his fingernails? Did she wear shoes? How much did they eat for breakfast? What is snow? And then they pay no attention to the answers. My husband, bored with their babbling, neither listens nor speaks. But here there is no fodder for small talk. The weather is always the same. Nothing happens. Though at times I feel the trees rocking in place like grief, clenching the dirt with tortuous toes. There is nothing to eat here but raw beets and turnips. There is nothing to drink but mud-filtered rain. Of course, no one goes hungry or toils, however many. The dead breed like the bulbs of daffodils, without sex or seed, all underground, yet no race has such increase, worse than insects. I miss you and think about you often. Please send flowers. I am forgetting them. If I yank them down by the roots, they lose their petals and smell of compost. Though I try to describe their color and fragrance, no one here believes me. They think they are the same thing as mushrooms. Yet no dog is so loyal as the dead who have no wives or children and no lives, no motives, secret or bare to disobey. Plus, my husband is a kind, kind master. He asks nothing of us, nothing at all. Thus fall changes to winter, winter to fall, while we learn idleness, a difficult lesson. He does not understand why I write letters. He says that you will never get them. True, mulched leaf paper sticks together, then rots. No ink but blood, and it turns brown like the leaves. He found my stash of letters, for I had hid it, thinking he'd be angry, but he never angers. He took my hands in his hands, my shredded fingers, which I have sliced for ink, thin paper cuts. My effort is futile, he says, and doesn't forbid it. Um, so, you know, I think in the classics department, this is University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia in the very, very late eighties, um, which was a very hip and cool town in those days, as I'm sure it is still an ever hip and cool town. Um, when we were studying classics there, and I know we were really interested in, um, mythology, particularly and the female figures of mythology. Um, but we were also... I think kind of inspired being in that town um, of lots of people being creative, or as I think you phrased it once, um, people went to the art school in order to flunk out and become rock stars. That was kind of <laughs> the ethos yeah. at the time. Um, but I mean, I think it's really interesting, particularly to be friends with someone who works in a very different medium. And um, because poets, I think, are just our medium is words. So we're really interested in hearing people talk about their art and all of the words and the jargon and the technical terms. Um, and this next poem I'm going to read, which is called Study in White, is um, completely inspired by a conversation I had with Ashley over the phone. Um, this was some years after college, um, where you were just discussing with me the problems of um, different kinds of paint if you are thinking about eventually becoming pregnant and having children. And um, I think it works very well in the poem in a way because I can kind of borrow that and make it 
um, more metaphorical. But I like the fact that it is literally true, as I understand it, before being figurative. Um, for those people who are following at home, um, wondering what received forms things are in, um, Persephone writes a letter to her mother in blank verse, and this is a kind of um, adjusted Villanelle-like poem, study in white. A friend, an artist, phoned me up and said, what shall I do for flesh and what for bone? All has some white and the best white is lead. But lead gets in the flesh and in the bone. And if you are a woman in the child, you bear years hence. And I know, have read that you may use titanium or zinc, not poisonous, but you may be reviled because you lack the seriousness bred for art in men. Or how else could you think of compromise in this? And I own I've tried them both, but the best white is lead for making up the colors bold and mild, conceiving still lifes, matching tone with tone to reproduce the spectra of the dead. And I have stood for hours at the sink, scrubbing white from hands until they bled. And still my hands are stained and still I think, oh, flesh and bone, but the best white is lead. So I don't know how that sounds to you now after all those years. Maybe I, I misconstrued. I don't use lead anymore, actually. <laughs> I got over it. But, you know, it's very tied to the feeling that, that we had uh, in school, that I had in school, that I was taught in school, which was that mothers are bad artists and artists are bad mothers. I mean, that was... So if you dared to do both, then you were really a monster. <laughs> but Yes, exactly. Um, and yet we we both did that. And so I, I love hearing the poem again because it reminds me of that. And it's, it's a topic that I've just curated a show about this that's opening this week at SUNY. So it's something I'm still very interested in. Yeah. Um, and I love this painting that you have up with the, the pregnant woman in the hammock and the sort of threatening and yet abundant bees and... Um, all the creatures that are crawling around. That's great. Um, yes. The uh, another, well, I was gonna say, when you talk about artists and mothers, I mean, there's a similar thing with poets, you know, because first of all, if you're a female poet, you know, when are you gonna commit suicide or whatever? That used to be one of the things. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Margaret Atwood or something, I think it's she who says, you know, when she was starting out and as a poet, people asked her not if, but when she was going to commit suicide. Um, but I think also then you get the flip side of that, which is the mommy poets, you know, where you get kind of, oh, well, you're writing about babies and children. So you're a mommy poet. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really get why that is a bad thing. Well, and babies and children are a sweet, cutesy subject that that right. has no no I anxiety or angst in it at all, as any mother knows from raising children. How right? I mean, fun. and it, you just you're <laughs> so you know you're so kind of close there to the the gates of of death as well as birth. In fact, maybe I would read this ultrasound poem, which I think kind of fits into that because to me, I think carrying life in that way and thinking about it. Um, made one much more aware of mortality than almost mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this poem, Ultrasound, um, which is again about that kind of deep um, ambiguity, I think, of pregnancy. Ultrasound. And oh, and it's got a butterfly, which is not in this uh, painting, but it's in other paintings. Most paintings have butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> What butterfly, brain, soul, or both unfurls here pallid as a moth? Listen, here's another ticker counting under mine and quicker. In this cave, what flickers fall, adumbrated on the wall, spine like beads strung on a wire, abacus of our desire, moon face where two shadows rhyme, Two moving hands that tell the time. I am the room the future owns, the darkness where it grows its bones. Mm. And of course, you know, 
as it's got a little bit of Plato's cave in there because you know I can't not mm -hmm. stick something classical in. <laughs> you know, even great. if it's my womb, my own womb. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and we were talking about this poem, um, Song for the Women Poets, um, because it kind of it combines a couple of different things that I think concern both of us and um also another reminder of um oh. friends um from Athens, Georgia, and back in the day. Um, I think Ashley, we're both really obsessed with the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, particularly as it plays out in Virgil's Georgics um, and how it starts, you know, with she's bitten on her heel by a snake in the grass as she's like fleeing a, a rape um, uh -huh. and um, then ends up in this underworld and the, the thing with bees. But I think we, we both have fixated on some of the similar um, aspects of that. Um, and in this uh, poem, Song for the Women Poets, it's, you know, Orpheus is generally the symbol for poets um, who goes down to the underworld and sings and tries to get his love back. But then, you know, if you're, again, talking about how we plug ourselves into these myths, if you are the woman in that case, how do you plug yourself in? So um, this just sort of directly tries to figure that out. <laughs> Not for the women poets. Sing, sing, because you can. Descend in murk and pitch. Double talk the ferryman and three-throated bitch. Sing before the king and queen. Make the grave to grieve. Till Persephone weeps kerosene and wipes it on her sleeve. And she will grant you your one wish to fetch across a river, black and sticky as licorice, the one you lost forever. Don't look back, but no one heeds. You glance down in the water. The image drowning in the weeds could be your phantom daughter. And part of you leaves Tartarus, but part stays there to dwell. You who are both Orpheus and she he left in hell. Yes. So this is this is inspired also by Eurydice, but uh, she's stepping on a snake. But it's a it's a cotton mouth water moccasin, which I imagine that if you grew up in Atlanta like me, like this was my biggest fear in life was cotton mouth water moccasin. <laughs> so it was. I love um, the cotton mouth and the colors. Yeah. Um. And the, and the bees foreshadowing, you know, the bees that are to come. Mm hmm and her pedicure which yeah. she would have because she was like a, about to get yeah. married of course she went and oh. got a pedicure, right yeah and also just like if you're gonna paint feet you gotta do a pedicure <laughs> it's like part of the thing it's it's too easy because it's paint <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. wonderful. um so we have i think we have a little sound clip um if we can manage we do if that I can much manage to technological find. accomplishment so our friend burnley vest also from our time in athens georgia um when i was uh, running for a poetry office in england um that i didn't win but um it was a fun event um this was my sort of anthem was this poem and burnley um set it to music and i thought since we just heard that poem we might hear a little bit of this wonderful setting that he did which starts with the eerie sound of the theremin if we can manage i think i think we can now make sure tell me when it starts if uh share can you hear it mm -hmm. sing sing because you can descend in murk and pitch double talk the fairy man and three throated bitch sing before the king and queen make the grave to breathe i won't play the whole thing because we have limited time but, but you can it's available on sound, SoundCloud and it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I mean, I was really, it's, I think it's, it's always fun. I mean, to hear if someone sets something to music or 
um, if you're talking about words and images, just because you you end up thinking about your own work a little bit differently. Like I like how, you know, when you have the three-throated bitch, you have this like, you know, tripartite kind of harmony that comes in there. I have, I have had people query that line, you know, they're like, but Cerberus is, uh, is male. And I'm like, okay, you've missed the whole point of that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> um, yeah. <let's> <laughs> um, well, you know, I think another thing that we have, let's see, I'm trying to figure out, should we do like two more poems? Um, Let's see. Here's well, the bees. the bees, the bees is something that I think we're both very interested in. Again, it partly comes out, I, I think, of, of the Georgics and just this great moment where suddenly instead of talking about beekeeping, we are talking about, you know, life and death and cycles and all of this stuff and this wonderful, really creepy um, myth. Um, and of course, Virgil is also borrowing from um, Homer with some of the similes and, you know, the idea of, of the army of bees or bees as an army. Um, this one has that kind of sense of the, the bees kind of coming right at you out of the, out of the um, canvas here. But you also have some three-dimensional bees. Which yeah, are, yeah, I do. Yeah, I are. haven't. I, those are amazing. I haven't seen those in person yet, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing them. Um, you know, and I think also as mothers at this and artists at this time in the world, you know, we're very concerned about the climate and about the pollinators and about everything. So I think it just continues to feed our interest in bees. Um, I think well, it's there's also a sense that Virgil sees the bees as a reflection of what has happened in his lifetime in Rome. And I think for us, we see the bee, at least for me, I see the, like the bad things happening to bees as some kind of almost magical effect of evil. <laughs> it's that, like right. parallel to the things. Yeah. Right. Which, which, yeah, you thought, that, which is exactly that kind of where they, um, in Virgil, you know, they revive the hive by you know beating up this dead bull and um it's mm -hmm. also mystical and weird um i think on on twitter and so forth there's a lot of t-shirts and so that say like ask a classicist about bees because <laughs> oh, that's great <laughs> <laughs> it's the good way to distract people um i have a couple of, of bee poems um this one is called colony collapse disorder and um, it actually starts with a translation out of the Iliad, which again, um, Virgil also borrows from this simile. So I think it kind of feeds into Virgil and Homer and the things that we are talking about, because this is about colony collapse disorder. Just as a swarm pours from a hollow rock in one long beeline for the wild time, alighting in clusters on this purple and that, but is stricken with a mass amnesia that disorients the compass of the sun and they forget the steps to traditional dances and each helicopters into a different dim dimness taking their saddlebags of sweetness with them and the hive goes dark, the queen is left to starve and the drones humbug the whimper of the world and the palace falls to ruins broken into by vandals who would loot the golden stores left in the brittle wax hexa hexameters just so. Wow. This Homeric simile that just- And the hexameters are great with bees. <laughs> Wow. I know hexameters are great with bees, aren't they? It's yes, great. it all. They comes have together. their hexagons. Um, so I, I'm trying to figure out where we. Okay. Um, so I thought we might also do um, accident waiting to happen. Um, this is another thing where I think um, part of being an artist and being a mother, maybe also. Um, is this awareness of risk taking, um, this awareness of danger and risk. I mean, it's just everywhere. I mean, especially if you have a toddler or whatever, you're just basically, you know, trying to death proof your house. 
And it's impossible <laughs> because it's, as soon as you figure one thing out and then, you know, you have teenagers and it's like a whole, a whole different scary kind of set of things. Um, but for me, I think uh, that this went hand in hand with a certain kind of awareness of artistic kind of risk, if that makes any sense, and dangers, just this perception that danger was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a poem called Accident Waiting to Happen. Um, it was dedicated to a friend's son who was um, not at all risk averse <laughs> named Finn. <laughs> um, uh, but it kind of starts off, I think, also from just exploring these similes, accidents waiting to happen. Like the scalding cup of coffee you left at the brink of the table, I brim with potential. I'm bright and unstable as a just mopped floor. I'm a curtain near a candle. Finger in the door, a loose axe handle. I'm the wrist flicked fast with no backwards look, blindly casting the innocent fish hook. I'm the toy on the stair, the hole in the street. I'm right in plain sight. I'm under your feet. I'm over your head. I've got an edge and I hang by a thread. It's almost time and my aim is steady. You're falling for me. I feel it. I'm ready. And of course, you know, I've got a Damoclean sword in there too. I just realized there's always something, you know, even if it's kind of very off to the side. Um, I remember one time in Athens, I think when maybe we were rooming together and you you had come back from one of those um, sort of workshops or whatever where, where your fellow students would comment on art, on your art. And um, and everyone was very disdainful of that, you know, because everyone's sort of, I guess, proto-goth and, you know, abstract. And, and you had to give a defense of the gold and the painting. And at least in my memory, you, 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 the way you told the story is like, because it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was absolutely the most radical thing you could have said in Athens, Georgia in 1988 in the arts. That's true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> and I think about that often because, you know, just how, um, how subversive the pleasure principle is in art and poetry and that's why sometimes people don't like it because um, it's almost like a puritanical thing. They don't want something to be pleasurable. That means it's therefore not serious or. Well, and isn't that one of the things that concerned Plato about poetry that it was. Well, um, yeah. true. They don't get to go to the Republic, but you know, he wanted to be a poet, you know, he was a failed poet. So. Yeah. Maybe that's why they don't. I mean, that's the real reason. <laughs> Um, so I was thinking of uh, maybe, because I know we have like questions and answers coming up and I might um, kind of end with this poem, Glitter, but you have a painting about I glitter. I do have a painting about glitter. Here it is. Oh yeah, I love this one. You want to tell us a little bit about this painting before I read So it? to me, this is like ages of female creativity. <laughs> So you start making this thing with glitter and she's so into it. And then you end up cleaning it up. <laughs> <laughs> the old lady yeah, has I, to clean it up. And in between yeah, I like the, the, sort of the triangle of the, the heart, the glue, the handheld vacuum cleaner. Yes. The, the kind of dangerous looking scissors. The yeah. psychotic intensity of the girls <laughs> look at the, at the heart of the glitter. And in the background, I don't know if anybody would catch this, but there's a red cardinal, really red cardinal chasing a less colorful female cardinal across. Oh, right. No. And I like the the fingernails of the kid who is like, I don't, is the kid. She's sort of on the girl? phone, this one. Yeah. And I like the green nails and the red nails. Yeah. That's really fun. Um, and the cats and everything. Yeah, basically, we're not allowed to have glitter in my house anymore because glitter never goes away. That's it. Never it goes away forever. I have this. Yeah, so I have this sonnet. It's called Glitter, um, and it it takes its epigraph from uh, British Vogue, 
that says all that will remain after an apocalypse is glitter. And I think that's true. <laughs> there will be glitter. There's out. nothing else. You have a daughter now. It's everywhere. And often in the company of glue. You can't get rid of it. It's in her hair. A wink of pink, a glint of silver blue. It's catching like the chicken pox or lice. It travels like a planetary scar. Sometimes it's on your face or you look twice and glimpse there on your arm, a single star. You know it by a hand's brushing your neck. You blush. It's not desire, not anymore. Just someone's urge to flick away the fleck of borrowed glamour from your collarbone. The broken mirror time will not restore the way your daughter marks you as her own. Love that one. Oh, and the purple cat. That's fantastic. Um, did you, I mean, I can read another poem. I'm not sure how we're doing um, time. How are we doing? No, how are we doing? Oh, we've gone an, an hour. No, we've gone a half hour. It's 2.06. Okay. So we you can we do have, another poem. Okay. Um, so the, going back to um, the Eurydice and the, uh, the snake, I love the, your cotton mouth snake. We'll go back um, to that. Yeah, let's go back to that. So this is another one of these poems, I think, that um, maybe very obliquely has to do with, with these things, but it's called Momentary. I never glimpse her, but she goes, who had been basking in the sun, her links of chain mail one by one, a glint with pewter, bronze, and rose. I never see her lying coiled atop the garden step or under a dark leaf, unless I blunder and by some motion she is foiled. Too late I notice as she passes, zither of chromatic scale. I only ever see her tail quicksilver into tall grasses. I know her only by her flowing, by her glamour disappearing into shadow as I'm nearing. I only recognize her going. I love that. I noticed. I mean, I'm so scared of snakes that it's, I'm in an emotional state to even paint them, but it's <laughs> so much fun to paint scales that I do it anyway because of all those little things that you can make out of paint that are like little. Yeah, tabs. those sort of jeweled scales. I mean, mm -hmm. I think like in this poem, the the pewter bronze and rose, um, I think they're very influenced by Elizabeth Bishop's Sandpiper, where she's talking about the grains of sand. And I think I was just really jealous. And I, I was like, I want to get those things, those sorts of lists into this poem. Um, but again, I think this kind of almost painterly idea of the of the glinting different colors of scales. And I noticed I've got like two poems back to back that both have glamour in them. And I realize it's one of my favorite words because it's um, etymologically linked to grammar. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So yes. yeah, grammar is a kind of um, magic or spelling. And so that's how we get glamour. So whenever oh. I can get glamour into a poem, I try to get that in there or grammar. Do you want to look at um, one another more poem? Oh, you want one, another poem? I think we've looked at the paintings. I, I'd like to hear another poem. Let's do another poem. Um, let's see. Yeah, we've still looked at them. All right. I was going to try. There's another poem in here that's directly related to Ashley. Actually, there are probably many poems that are related to conversations with Ashley. But this, this was one um, that I read at your wedding. And... Uh you know, also, I think we, we spent a lot of time in Athens, Georgia, talking about the Odyssey. Were we ever not talking about the Odyssey? We were always talking about the we Odyssey. We were always talking about the Odyssey. It was Odyssey. pretty much the whole thing was four plus years of talking about the Odyssey. Yeah. <laughs> so the Odyssey comes into a lot of poems. And um, this is one of them, which is called Homecoming. Because, um, you know, I guess I, what I one of the things I love about the description of 
um, uh, Odysseus and Penelope's marriage. It, well, I think it's when he's he's kind of giving the polite brush off to Nausicaa, and you know he he talks about you know what a perfect um, marriage is, and it's you know you you you're a joy to your friends and a woe to your enemies. I always thought that that was, that would be a great thing to put like on a wedding invitation. <laughs> but just this idea of there being perfectly, um, perfectly matched homecoming. It was as if she pulled a thread each time he saw her that unraveled all the distance he had traveled to sleep at home in his own bed or sit together in a room spinning yarns of monsters, wars, hours counted by the chores. He loved to watch her at the loom, the fluent wrists, the liquid motion of small tasks not thought about, the shuttle leaping in and out, dolphins sewing the torn ocean. Wow, yeah. It seems to be also, it was kind of weirdly, um, prophetic yeah because when Shelby went when my husband I mean you read that at, at our wedding but uh or at the the rehearsal dinner and and then when he went to Afghanistan in the military we talked a lot about the Odyssey like that kind of brought the Odyssey back to me and and he was really interested in it then too so it was that was fun well I yes. and also reading this besides the fact that you know Shelby actually does go to Afghanistan <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe you made like maybe that was your poem made that happen in which case I'm i know i do much. worry about that <laughs> I, I do actually believe that poems have actual yes. prophetic properties i do believe that yeah um, but the other thing is it's i'm suddenly looking at this and realizing that penelope you know she's painting really she's I mean, painting yeah. she's telling her story and unweaving her story and he's telling all these stories to try to get back to her but so, so much of this like it could be the fluent wrists the liquid motion um, you know, and this idea, I think also of painting as, you know, where it's, it's much more sort of malleable in some ways than weaving or whatever, where you can smudge something or paint over something. And it's got a very penelopizing, penelopizing quality to it, where you're making and unmaking. I don't know. You oh, yes. Think. Painting is very much like that. You're constantly unmaking. It's as big a part of it as the making. Um, and one of the things I like where you talk about your painting is your interest in in messiness. And yes, because it's my biggest talent is messiness. And this is the only thing I've managed to apply it to that anybody has let me get away with. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I like that idea of kind of embracing also, you know, mistakes within um the painting yes. deciding that you know to make them intentional well and, and like, i was thinking that when you're talking about accidents in the studio and accidents um in raising children the fear or the constant fear that that you know you're looking for the happy accident in the studio right and maybe you're looking to allow the children to have happy accidents without allowing them to have any unhappy ones, which is actually impossible. Impossible, that's right. Uh, so you're constantly in this state of chaos and fear. Um, maybe I'll read one more and I don't know, for some reason I can't see the clock on this one. Um, the, the stain, um, because I, I think a lot, I, I have a lot of poems about things like, you know, stains and spills and breakages. And this is partly because, as you know, I'm clumsy and we were both messy. I don't know how Ellen dealt with either of us. Yeah, um, we were. <laughs> um, but uh, so the stain kind of um, makes me think about that. I have poems. I have a lot of poems about laundry. I have more poems about laundry than I, you know, have clean laundry, but. Um, so <laughs> this, this, uh, the thing about cleaning and stains is something that comes again and again. The stain remembers your embarrassment, wine or blood, sweat or oil, when the ink leaked your intent because you thought no truth could soil or when you let the secret slip or when you dropped the leaden hint or when between the cup and lip, the Beaujolais pled innocent 
or when the rumor's fleet was launched, or when the sheets waged their surrender, but the breach could not be staunched and no apology would tender. When overserved, you misconstrued and blurbed your heartsick on your sleeve. When everything became imbued with sadness, yet you couldn't grieve, inalienable as DNA, self-evident as fingerprints, it will not out although you spray and pre-soak in the sink and rinse. What they suspect, the stain will know. The stain records what you forget. If you wear it, it will show. If you wash it, it will set. One of my favorites. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, um, so I think there's a lot of poems, as there are with the paintings, where... I mean, I've started calling it like the mytho domestic, the sphere of the mytho domestic, where, you know, things in the house or in the everyday life um, suddenly kind of shimmer with um, meaning, you know, which might be quite. Which don't you think that's a big part of what witchcraft is and was like the idea that the like, you have to make the candles so that you'll there'll be light in the house. So you're making the candles and then you're investing them with something magical or you're making the uh, there's a lot of like I feel like investing magic into into the domestic sphere that happens in, right in the, I mean I think you know that must have happened when yeast was discovered and yes know, it started to rise I mean you know in somebody's particular in some particular person's warm kitchen or whatever and then people thought wow you know this is something magical that is happening Mm -hmm. um yeah I think I would I would buy that I mean you know it's kind of interesting going back to our odyssey conversation that all of the women in the odyssey are witchy you know, mm -hmm. um so uh, that wonderful um book the authoress of the odyssey by Samuel Butler which is just one of my favorite really wacky books but he has this wonderful insight he said all all of the families are the same family and all of the women are the same woman and they're all witchy. Yeah, you're right. They and they all kind of control events in a in a sort of almost supernatural way. Right. And that yeah. is the fear and the concern. Mm -hmm. That's good. Cool. Uh, well, um, I'm gonna hop back on here and say thank you. First of all, this has been this has been a blast. Um love, love hearing you bounce ideas off each other and, and see your collaboration in real time in a way. Um, we don't get a lot of multimedia events. So this has been a treat. We have a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm just going to hop right in uh, with some of these. We have one actually from Burnley Vest, whose music we heard earlier. <laughs> uh, we have a few from Burnley. Um, this one is for Alicia. Have you ever found yourself identifying with the burrowing animals in Persephone's letter? Should anyone so identify? And Burnley says, I ask, because I sort of identify with the burrowed animals myself. Um, do I identify with the burrowing animals? Um, maybe so. I mean, I don't know. I'm very, uh, I feel very empathetic with animals and I'm very interested in the ones that are kind of, you know, under the radar and under the earth. Um, you know, I, but I realized that when I wrote that particular poem and I was in this basement apartment, which I think both Burnley and Ashley will remember, and um, it was actually the basement apartment of John Crow Ransom's niece's house um, and just being physically under the ground and, you know, seeing people, you know, at shoe level or whatever, and literally hearing things like the the shovel in the ground and kind of feeling it through. So I think that led to that empathy. Um, maybe I haven't answered that question in the way it was intended. I'm not sure. No, but just for Burnley's sake, I have to say when you were reading that poem, I was thinking about how much Hades resembles the 40 watt club. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, in Athens. That's true. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of basement and dark places mm -hmm. and dives the downstairs i mean and the downstairs was in the basement yeah we yeah. had this in fact we were in, um ashley filmed um a concert that um burnley vest had at the downstairs that i was involved in on the on the fiddle uh, attack the downstairs um mm -hmm. and you know that was literally 
below street level. So I think there was a sense that, and I do feel that with the underworld is also the subconscious, isn't it? I mean, it's what Mm -hmm. is underneath. So for me, the underworld, hell, if you like, um, is a very creative place. Mm -hmm. These are great answers. Um, Maybe going back to where where we ended up with the mytho domestic, maybe brings us back to the early conversation of monsters and mothers. Um, And Hannah Kent asks, what monster mothers or mother monsters do you take inspiration from? And that's for both of you. Ashley, you wanna take that one first? (laughs) Um, Yes, it's in mythology and in real life. Don't you have a poem about, um, you have a poem about an art monster mother. Yeah, I have a, well, it's, I have a lot of poems about the Minotaur, who who yes. is a monster, who is l- literally, you know, because the mother is monstrous, because she falls in love with this white bull from the sea, and has to have a contraption made so that she can have um, intercourse with this creature so she's quite monstrous and then the result is this monster and he's I mean talking about the burrowing animals he's a creature I have huge empathy for this kind of unusual creature that is shut up in this labyrinth it always and he's a wonderful figure in so much of art and I always feel sorry for him he I always have a lot of important to Picasso Picasso yes, identifies important. with them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, there's even these wonderful classical sculptures where, you know, he's, he, I don't know, he seems quite noble and you feel really sad that, you know, he gets tricked by his half sister and stabbed in the dark. It's nasty. Yeah. This is probably a very literal take, but <laughs> 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 I am nothing if not literal, like with everything. Um, yeah. I think that's great. Um, we have, let's see, um, we have a, a few questions about translation, so maybe we can we can combine these. Uh, Megan Drinkwater asks if you can speak to how your poetry and translation work have enhanced or challenged each other. Um, and Elizabeth Morosky asks, are you working on any translations at the present? And then again, how does translating transfer to your own work? Um, well, I, you know, translation, it's a great thing for a poet to be working on because you always have something you can work on. So you don't have to, you know, if you write even like a great sonnet and it is great, the next day it's the blank page and you have nothing, nothing. Um, Whereas, you know, if you're working on a translation, you can always get down to work and you get to be someone else. So you're not stuck in, you know, you can be another race, gender, language, era. You can have different opinions. Um, I I find it very freeing, but also you get to use all of those muscles that you're using for your own poetry. So I just feel it's it's just a good thing to have um, to have recourse to. In theory, right now, I'm actually working on the Georgics. I have not yet got to the bit about the bees, which I'm very excited and anxious about um, because, you know, it's the, the greatest poem by the greatest poet. Um, in theory, and that's the greatest bit of the greatest poem. Um, but I'm really looking forward to working on, on especially the bees. Well, that's definitely something to look forward to. I'll be awaiting for it. Um, uh, we have another one for, for both of you. Have you or will you two collaborate on a book of paintings and corresponding poems? Sure. If someone wants sure. to bring that out. Publish it, I will paint. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're open. If there's anyone out there that wants to commission this, we'll do it. I mean, You've there's such a long parallel between. I mean, part of what's so great about being friends with Alicia is that we've we met when we were the same age in the same place. And since then, we have made our art and our poetry and had our children. And it seems like it's just like there's a poem that I need at exactly the moment I need it because Alicia's <laughs> going through this, like, like whether it's glitter or she's always writing about the same things that I'm concerned about because she's at sort of the same place. Yeah. And vice, vice versa. There's, you know, the paintings are concerned with like a lot of the things that I'm, and I think also maybe this is something that we didn't discuss, but 
Um, we're both, in a sense, um, Boeotian artists. In this, you know, you can be an Athenian artist or a Boeotian artist. So if you're an Athenian artist, you're living in New York City. You're living mm -hmm. in a in a in a center mm -hmm. like London or Paris. And we're both. Um, I mean, Athens maybe is its own cultural center, but in terms of being an American poet, I am living outside of the center of American poetry. And you know, Ashley's in. Cooperstown in upstate New York. And so I think that has also given us a slightly different perspective that we're not kind of, you know, in the middle of where artists and writers tend to be so that we're making art kind of on the periphery of these things. And that has given us, I think, a different perspective also. You know, it's funny because you're living in Athens is what helped me be comfortable in Cooperstown, because I remember at a time when I we were younger and I thought Alicia should come back to the States, she could get a job at a university, what is she doing? And you said, I can write a lot of poems here because nobody can make me do anything else. <laughs> and I realized, <laughs> yeah, that's actually true of Cooperstown too. And suddenly I became really happy with Cooperstown. I could paint because I was like off in this place where there was nothing else to do and there were no jobs for me, so I could just paint. There's that. Yeah. Well, we're very grateful here in the Athenian Center for you all <laughs> bringing your perspective. Um, <laughs> let's see, we've got time for maybe one or two more. Um, I think this is a very interesting question from an anonymous attendee um, about figurative painting and verse poetry. Um, they say figurative painting has now very much returned in contemporary art. Modernism was sort of you know, and abstraction was a, a, a moment where figurative painting was out of the limelight. Not necessarily the case with meter and rhyme and poetry, except in Alicia's work. Wondering if you have any thoughts on a relationship between figurative painting and, and verse, formal verse poetry and the turning tides. I, I We've actually discussed a lot about this. Um, one of the things I think we would both say is kind of being in Athens, Georgia at that period in the kind of late 80s um, when there was so much creativity going on and it you know it's this small town again not maybe in the middle of where things are supposed to be happening but things were happening there because people decided to make it the important place the the omphalos of of hipness or cool and I think both of us at around the same time kind of decided that although what we were doing was not the mainstream of coolness um you could be hip as it were <laughs> by doing what you wanted to do and being yourself mm -hmm. and pleasing your friends I mean you know you could see that in things like the b-52s or whatever um you know who are kind of going against the grain and doing kind of wacky things and you know there were and there were other things that were going there were like um uh people would share songs um there was interest in folk music and you could be some, sometimes by being super uncool you could be cool in Athens in those days <laughs> um and so since we like realized we couldn't be cool cool I think we decided to be like subversive cool by you know being weird classic students and doing things that were not mainstream like rhyming your poems and there was an attitude to that you could have an attitude to not following the mainstream uh -huh. and there wasn't any figurative painting a few years I mean it hasn't been long suddenly it, it is experiencing a resurgence so um I think that's um I think that that also probably goes back to the not choosing to live in the center of things that we're just we're going to live where we can make the kind of art we want to make and where we're inspired to make the kind of art we want to make and and I think maybe Athens taught us to see inspiration in in strange out of the way places yeah, and I think there was this sense too of like you're kind of making it as like is Ashley gonna like this is Ellen gonna like this is Brunley mm -hmm. gonna like this you were like if your audience was your friends and you know that's who you wanted to please and in a way, I think that's a key to finding an audience because, you know, there will be other people in this world of however many zillions of people we are who have that same sensibility so that if you are not dumbing things down and you're pleasing yourself and pleasing your really cool, really smart friends, um, then, you know, hopefully there will be other people who would be your friend, <laughs> you know, you just haven't uh -huh. met them and who will get what you're doing. And I think it 
like Athens kind of gave us a little of the faith of like, there will be other people who get this. And maybe like, I mean, I guess this would have happened if we'd studied something different, but in the classics part, we were always talking about these very small groups of friends, like that lived in Rome and knew each other and a dialogue between them. And I think we kind of saw ourselves as like, the, I mean, it's like yeah. them in a way that maybe if we'd been at somewhere more important, we would have been more humble actually yes. in a strange way so. and then and humble isn't that helpful to an artist actually so. no I mean I think there was this uh, I mean yeah I often think about that you think about like fifth century Athens and you know it's this really small group of people who all know each other and are all related to each other and we're still gossiping about them yes yeah, so we're still <laughs> trying to figure out you know who Catullus's girlfriend really was and all this kind of stuff so and which was very much like living in Athens where we were yeah not so very much like indeed. yeah and in two, three, four, five thousand years, we'll still be talking about Alicia Stallings and Ashley Norwood Cooper and the amazing <laughs> collaborations that they've done. Um, this has been such a treat. Thank you both so much for this. Um, and those of you at home, uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for your very thoughtful questions. Please consider purchasing a copy of This Afterlife from Community Bookstore or Terrace Books or your local independent bookstore, wherever you may be. And we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again to Cheris and to uh, Agnes Scott College and Emory's Classics Departments for putting this together. Alicia, Ashley, thanks again and have a great day. Thank you, Noah. Thank you.